Well, good evening to you all. And uh, it is a, a joy, a blessing for me to be back here in Chino Hills. It is a blessing to be anywhere in the world to serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to lift up his name, the name that is above every other name. And I'm here, as last time, on behalf of my church, Hazel Grove Full Gospel Church in the town of Stockport, just outside Manchester in the north of England. And uh, on behalf of my pastor, Andrew Robinson, I uh, bring you warm greetings from that small fellowship that loves the Lord, is looking for his appearing, stands with Israel, and, and just seeks to bless and serve the body of Christ. Well, I've been given the most wonderful uh, title by the Lord, Son of God, and it's been a, a wonderful day of ministry, a wonderful day of fellowship, and uh, I hope and trust that all of you have been touched in some way by the Lord through His Spirit, and that is my prayer tonight through this session. So just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you all the glory for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, without whom we would not be here, we would have no reason to be here, and more than that, we would be without hope. But we thank you for the blessed hope that we have through your Son and in your Son, Jesus our Lord and Savior and soon coming King. And so, Father, we pray that this will be a session like all the other sessions that will touch your heart, a session that would touch each of our hearts as your Holy Spirit just moves and glorifies the Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, any of you been to Israel? Any of you been to the Garden Tomb? If you've been to the Garden Tomb, you will recognize this scripture that's written on these lovely tiles as you walk down the path. Jesus Christ declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Words taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome way back in the, in the first century. And we're going to begin... In the Gospels, we're going to begin with the Word of God, just lay a foundation, just take encouragement from what God has revealed in His Word concerning His Son. That revelation that God the Father has given to the, the whole world marks the beginning and the end of the Gospels. As we read in Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as we read towards the end of Mark's gospel, that wonderful testimony and declaration made by the Roman centurion as he saw the way the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Truly, this man was the Son of God. And we can go to the beginning of John's gospel. And what a blessed opening we have to uh, John's account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we read in that chapter, chapter 1, of the time when Philip brought Nathanael to meet the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus said as Nathanael approached, Behold, a true Israelite, or an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael replied, How do you know me? And Jesus said, before Philip brought you, when you were sat under the fig tree, I knew you. Just like the Lord knows every single person in this place. Whether you are saved or you're not saved, the Lord knows you. And how did Nathaniel respond to the Lord Jesus? With this incredible declaration, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Where did that come from? Nathaniel had not met the Lord Jesus. He didn't know the Lord Jesus at that point, but God the Father put that revelation in the heart of this man who was to be such a faithful disciple of his Messiah and Savior. And then we come to the end of John's Gospel, and John writes how Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So if the revelation of Jesus being the Son of God marks the beginning and the end of the Gospels, it also marks that 
foundation stone, that foundational confession in the church. On the road to Caesarea Philippi, you recall how the Lord asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? And many men out there in the world have got all kinds of opinions as to who Jesus is. A great teacher, an enlightened one, a prophet, a son of God. But the apostle, or soon to be the apostle Peter, replied, You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus said to Simon Peter how blessed he was because such a revelation had been given to him by the Father. And if you're a Christian, if you're born again this evening, you're born again because God the Father put that revelation concerning His Son in your heart. As your heart inclined towards Him. As you knew that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. That you had no hope in any religion or in any good works. As you began to turn, as I began to turn, as a 19-year-old back in 1990 towards the Lord, that revelation came by the Holy Spirit into my heart that Jesus was and is the Son of God. And this became the revelation that was to so dramatically transform Saul of Tarsus and make him the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. As we read after his Damascus Road experience, when the Lord mercifully saved this righteous Pharisee, this zealous Pharisee who'd been seeking to destroy the church, as soon as the eyes of Saul of Tarsus were opened, what did he do? He went into the synagogues to his own people and immediately, as we read in Acts chapter 9, proclaimed Jesus, the one he had cursed, the one he had blasphemed, now the one he was worshipping and adoring, He proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And proving from the Scriptures that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. But what we're sharing this evening is the good news. The Gospel concerning God's Son. I don't know if any of you will have heard of Robert Cleaver Chapman. Uh, a saint of God who lived in the 19th century, 1803 to 1902, 99 years old when the Lord took him. And he was one of the foremost men amongst the early Plymouth Brethren, a movement that began in Dublin in Ireland in the late 1820s, which was formally established in Plymouth in the south of England in 1830. And this was a a much-loved leader of one of the Brethren Assemblies. And this is what he said in one of his addresses entitled, What Christ is to God. He asked this question, Let us ask, what makes heaven full of fragrance at this moment? Whence came it? Who brought it into heaven? The answer is the Son of God. By the fragrance of His atoning sacrifice has filled the holiest of all. That wonderful aroma that we read about in Ephesians chapter 5. How our Lord's sacrifice was so pleasing to the Father. His aroma, His fragrance, because of the sacrifice that He offered on that cross, fills heaven even now. Praise His name. Acts 13, 32 through 33. The Apostle Paul, in the synagogue, in Antioch, in Pisidia, said this, we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this He has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. I have brought you forth. John 3, 16, as my pastor shared many years ago, the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I love that word, whosoever. It doesn't matter what kind of a life we've had, what kind of a background or an upbringing we've had. It doesn't matter what we have done. Whosoever can come to the cross, whosoever can come 
to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And know at that moment, if that confession is true and sincere, that our Lord Jesus Christ will forgive. He will cleanse. He will reconcile you to God the Father. And He will come and dwell in your heart through the person of the Holy Spirit. And John continues in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 14, and then on into chapter 5. And we have seen. We have seen. What a privilege those first apostles had. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you think there's a message coming through here? Do you think there's something that God the Father, through the person of the Holy Spirit, wanted to bring to the world? Yeah, the message concerning His beloved Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 4, verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Herein is love. Well, I'm sure with me, this hymn is a, a favorite to many. Here is love, vast as the ocean. Put your hands up if you sing this hymn in your churches. Not many. Oh, let me tell you about this hymn. This was the hymn song of the Welsh revival of 1904-1905, when God moved in a mighty way in the, the small country of Wales in Great Britain. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us His precious blood. Who His love will not remember? Who can cease to sing His praise? He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. We sing this a lot in my fellowship. It has a, a special affinity with us because our pastor is Welsh. He describes himself as a, a Welsh pastor in exile because <laughs> he serves in England. He's not British. He's not European. He's Welsh. And uh, he's very proud of that. And I, I've shown you a, a photograph there of three Welsh miners taken from the time of the Welsh revival at the beginning of the 20th century. And at that time, God moved mightily in the coal pits right throughout the valleys of Wales, in many communities far and wide. God wonderfully touched lives, and men and women and children cried out to God for mercy. And there's many accounts of how miners covered with the, the soot of the coal, the coal dust, would be weeping, and you would be able to track the tears down their faces. And the Lord did mighty things as men cried out to God in what was a true Revival, And I remember reading one story of something that happened one day in the classroom. A six-year-old girl raised her hand, and her teacher, noticing that the hand of this little girl had been raised, invited her to ask the question. And the question from this little girl was simply, Miss, do you love Jesus? Do you know the Lord used that question to convict that teacher of her sin and her need of the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. It wasn't long before she was born again, she left her teaching job and became a, a missionary. <laughs> Through a little girl that had the, well, the love of the Lord in her heart enough to say, Miss, do you love Jesus? Or maybe the Lord would ask somebody here tonight, do you love Jesus? Do you love the Son of God? How many of you know this great hymn, How Great Thou Art? A few more of you. Again, this is very popular in our church. That uh, picture there is of the cross that hangs on the wall at the front of Hazel Grove for Gospel Church with the, the uh, linen garment draped across it. Let re me remind you of verse 3 of this great hymn, How Great Thou Art. And when I think 
that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And very often in our Sunday services and in our prayer meetings on a Monday night, our pastor will just pick up the guitar and he'll play that third verse and we'll sing it a few times. And then praise God, how great thou art, because you, our Father in heaven, our Creator, sent forth your Son to die in our place. Well, there's a, a wonderful story about this particular verse. That hymn began as a Swedish poem up in Scandinavia, in the, in the north. Uh, I can't remember the name of the man, but he wrote this poem after witnessing an incredible storm one night, witnessing the power of God, and then afterwards the stillness that came and hearing the birds singing in the trees. And he wrote this poem, and this poem was eventually translated into Russian, and it was used powerfully by God in the Carpathian Mountains of Eastern Europe, in the country we know today as the Ukraine. But this particular verse wasn't written by the Swedish author of that poem. It was written by a, a British Methodist missionary called Stuart Hine. And he wrote this particular verse in 1949. Let me tell you a little bit about Stuart Hine. Stuart Hine and his wife were called to bring the gospel to the people of Ukraine, and they learned Russian and and, and just gave their lives to serving the people and, and bringing the good news of God's Son to the Ukrainians. And we read how Hein first heard the Russian translation of the song while he was on a particular mission in 1931 near the Polish border. Upon hearing it, he was inspired to write this verse. And according to one author, Hein and his wife Edith learned the Russian translation and started using it in their evangelistic services. And Hein started rewriting some of the verses, and new verses as well, all in Russian, as events began to inspire him. And let me re read how this account continues. It was typical of the Heins to inquire as to the existence of any Christians in the villages where they visited. In one case, they found out that the only Christians their host knew about were a man named Dimitri and his wife, Lud Miller. Dimitri's wife knew how to read, evidently a fairly rare thing at that time and in that place. She taught herself how to read because a Russian soldier had left the Bible behind several years earlier, and she started slowly learning by reading that Bible. When the Hines arrived in the village and approached Dimitri's house, they heard a strange and wonderful sound. Dimitri's wife was reading from the Gospel of John about the crucifixion of Christ to a house full of guests. And those visitors were in the very act of repenting of their sin. In the Ukraine, this act of repenting is done very much out loud. And so the Hines heard people calling out to God, saying how unbelievable it was that Christ would die for their sins and praising Him for His love and His mercy. They just couldn't barge in and disrupt what was an obvious work of the Holy Spirit. And so they stayed outside and listened. Stuart Hine wrote down the phrases he heard the repenting Ukrainians use. And even though this was all in Russian, it became the third verse that we know today. And when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. There's some wonderful stories behind these great hymns that we sing in our churches.